to get it right. We still have a. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're trying. We still have an elbow well, length. We're seeing a little social distancing here. If you've been watching, George, you've noticed that there's often a, quite a crowd there behind the podium, uh, standing shoulder to shoulder uh, this time, like the rest of us here in the briefing room. Uh, there's a little separation, not quite six feet, as recommended, but uh, but but certainly more than we've seen in the past. And we will wash our hands when we're done. It's important. Este es un informe especial de Noticias Univisión. Muchas gracias. Creo que esto va a ser una conferencia muy importante y llegaré a hablar de esto en el medio de la conferencia, pero tengo algunas cosas que reportarles. Quiero dar a todos las gracias por estar acá y tengo que decir, creo que con el distanciamiento social, los medios han cumplido con todo esto, no sé, pero hay muchos vacíos, asientos vacíos acá entre la prensa, probablemente tampoco. Poco debe tener alguien sentado detrás de ustedes. Me encanta esto. Es mucho mejor esto. Bueno, no debo decir esto, pero bueno, gracias a todos por su presencia. Y continuamos nosotros nuestro esfuerzo sin pauta para derrotar el virus chino. Antes de comenzar, quiero comenzar diciendo que hoy día vamos a traer acá a nuestra nación otro ciudadano. Es algo muy, pero muy grande. Omer Feikori está de vuelta a los Estados Unidos después de haber estado encarcelado en el Líbano desde septiembre 20 de 2019. Está luchando contra el cáncer en las últimas etapas. Ahora va a poder recibir la atención tan necesaria y tratamiento en los Estados Unidos. Hemos estado trabajando arduamente para liberarlo y por fin puede tener a toda su familia a su costado, al lado de él. Estamos agradecidos por el gobierno, con el gobierno lebanés, ya que han trabajado con nosotros y estamos muy orgullosos de su familia. Lo respaldaron tanto y ellos están emocionados. Los Estados Unidos no tienen mayor prioridad que la seguridad y seguridad de nuestros ciudadanos. Tenemos, hemos sacado un gran número de rehenes, como ustedes saben, creo que son 42 ya. Y Robert O'Brien, como ustedes saben, fue el negociador principal con respecto a gran parte de esto. Funcionó también que ahora es un cargo diferente. Quiero dar las gracias y felicitar a Robert y a su equipo. Y deseo que todos sepan que el recuperar estados estadounidenses capturados y encarcelados en el extranjero es una prioridad principal para mi administración. Hay un joven, un caballero joven, Austin Tice, y estamos trabajando arduamente con Siria para sacarlo. Esperamos que el gobierno sirio así uh, actúe. Contamos que ellos actúen de esa manera. Le hemos escrito una carta recientemente y hace tiempo que también lo hacemos ya fue capturado hace mucho tiempo Austin Tice cuya madre probablemente está viéndonos y es una gran dama estamos haciendo todo lo más posible Siria por favor trabajen con nosotros en Siria le agradeceríamos que lo liberen piensen en lo que hemos hecho nosotros hemos eliminado el califato de ISIS en Siria hemos hecho mucho a favor de Siria tenemos que ver si ellos van a hacer esto. Le agradeceríamos muchísimo si ellos permiten que Austin salga inmediatamente. Como usted sabe, mi administración está trabajando todos los días para proteger el pueblo estadounidense y la economía estadounidense del virus. Ayer firmé para que se decrete como ley un apoyo crítico para los trabajadores estadounidenses, las familias y pequeños negocios, algo muy grande. Estamos uh, dándole licencia por enfermedad y, y por asuntos médicos, aquellos impactados por el virus, y tenemos más ayuda que viene. Todo nuestro equipo encaminado por el ministro Mnuchin está en el Capitolio trabajando con los demócratas y los republicanos. Hay muy buena voluntad entre ellos. Esto es algo que ha ocurrido que fue una acción de Dios. Yo no lo veo como una acción de Dios. Uh, yo veo como algo que sorprendió a todo el mundo. Y si la gente lo hubiera sabido, se hubiera detenido en el sitio, se hubiera detenido de dónde vino, en China. Si lo hubiéramos sabido y si ellos lo hubieran sabido. Pero ahora todo el mundo casi está infligido con este horrible 
con este horrible virus es eh, bien malo, bien malo, porque nunca habíamos tenido una economía tan buena como la economía que tuvimos hace unas pocas semanas atrás, pero volveremos, y yo creo que volveremos más fuerte que nunca antes, porque hemos aprendido muchísimo durante esta época. También puedo invocar la ley, eh, el Defense Production Act, la ley para exigir la producción de ciertos equipos en caso de guerra. Estamos trabajando con el Congreso para darle gran alivio a los trabajadores y pequeños negocios y las industrias que más han sido impactadas. Queremos cerciorarnos que todos puedan continuar para que una vez que nos recuperemos todas estas empresas y todos estos grandes negocios, ambos muy, muy pequeños y muy, muy grandes, no estén quebrantados y no tengan que remontarlos. Eso tomaría mucho tiempo. Creemos y yo creo, yo creo que esto va a, cuando esto, cuando esto sea derrotado, este azote eh, invisible, esto va a subir rápidamente, es decir, nuestra economía y vamos a comenzar a trabajar de nuevo y más allá también. Hoy día quiero emocionar, eh, compartir con ustedes un progreso emotivo que está haciendo el FDA eh, con el sector privado y hemos estado recortando regulaciones como nunca antes. Alguien en una de las cadenas dijo que nunca ha habido un presidente que ha podido acercarse a lo que yo he hecho, eh, eliminando todas estas regulaciones para hacer que se logren cosas muy importantes y se lleven al mercado asuntos médicos. Eh, eliminamos regulaciones para desarrollar vacunas y terapias con la mayor rapidez posible, mucho antes que alguien jamás haya pensado si quieren hacer esto. Como te sabe anteriormente, esta semana comenzamos el primer ensayo clínico de un candidato a vacuna para el virus. Eso fue lanzado con la rapidez como nunca antes, en unas pocas semanas nada más. Y eso hubiera tomado años lograr. No ahora. Al nosotros apurarnos para desarrollar una vacuna, también estamos nosotros tratando de desarrollar terapias antivirus, y de eso vamos a hablar hoy día. Es el propósito de estar aquí hoy día. Y para mí eso es aún más importante. La vacuna, por su índole, tiene que tener pruebas largas, porque hay que cerciorarse que lo que se le pone en el cuerpo a alguien no va a, a destruirlo, a hacer cosas malas. Así que se, se necesitan pruebas largas. Y están buen resultado con las vacunas, pero aún es un proceso largo. Pero las terapias son algo que nosotros podemos uh, desarrollar mucho más rapidez, rap, rápidamente en potencia. Y los tratamientos que podrán reducir la severidad y la duración de los síntomas hace que la gente se sienta mejor rápidamente. Básicamente, estamos buscando cosas para que la gente se mejore, o por lo menos en las primeras etapas ni siquiera sepan que lo tenían. Así que es donde yo creo que va a funcionar aún uh, de mejor manera. El FDA, comisionó, el comisionado del FDA, Stephen Hanus, está con nosotros. Él es fantástico. Y ha estado trabajando 24 horas al día. Ha estado uh, trabajando probablemente tan arduamente o más arduamente que cualquiera aquí en el grupo, aparte quizás Mike Pence o yo. Y lo que el FDA está haciendo es increíble. Han hecho cosas uh, en momentos que ni siquiera se pensaba se podían lograr con una rapidez y han instruido al FDA que eliminen reglas uh, antiguas y burocracia para proceder rápidamente, con rapidez y rápido. Tenemos que eliminar todas las barreras. Había muchas barreras uh, que eran innecesarias y lo han hecho para... De, para lanzar rápidamente tratamientos rápidos, eficaces, y creo que tenemos buenas respuestas. Lo sabremos muy, pero muy pronto. Ensayos clínicos ya están teniendo lugar para muchas nuevas terapias, trabajando para aumentar estas a grandes escalas para permitir a muchos más estadounidenses a tener accesos a diferentes fármacos que han demostrado gran promesa, gran promesa. Nosotros haremos esto de tal manera que nos permita continuar recopilando buenos datos para saber cuáles medicinas son las seguras y cuáles medicinas están funcionando de mejor manera. Tenemos un par de ellas que, que eh, están funcionando muy bien y hay esa entrega inmediata como tan pronto como las podamos conseguir. El FDA también está aprobando uso de, de 
con compasión para muchísimos pacientes. Saben ustedes lo que significa esto. También estamos repasando fármacos aprobados en el extranjero o fármacos aprobados acá para otros usos. Y saben, una de las cosas de la cual me siento más orgulloso que yo obtuve es el derecho de probar a alguien que está enfermo, a alguien que está muy enfermo, eh, con enfermedad terminal casi siempre. En las situaciones anteriores, Hace un año y medio no se podía aún pensar en obtener algunos de los fármacos que quizás son muy prometedores ahora y lo habían ensayado durante muchas décadas, se habían tratado de que se aprobara y no lo aprobaban porque había mucha responsabilidad civil y muchas otras cosas que le daban trabas. Yo pude aprobarlo trabajando con el Congreso del Derecho para aprobar. Esto va más allá del derecho a aprobar. De lo que hablamos hoy día va más allá del derecho de probar. El derecho de probar ha sido un éxito tremendo. La gente está viviendo ahora que no tenían oportunidad de vivir anteriormente. Tomamos cosas que hubieran tenido que pasar por años de procesos cuando alguien estaba terminalmente enfermo. Y yo diría, ¿por qué no van a poder tratar esto? Van a Asia, van a Europa, van en todas las partes del mundo para tratar de encontrar algo. Y si algunas personas no tienen dinero, se van a la casa a morir. Van a la casa a morir, no tenían esperanza alguna. Ahora con esto del derecho a vivir ha sido un éxito increíble. Pero esto va más allá del derecho de probar. Si los tratamientos conocidos seguros en Europa, Japón u otras naciones son eficaces con esa información, la usaremos para proteger la seguridad del pueblo estadounidense y nada se intrometerá a nosotros a hacer todo lo posible para encontrar lo que mejor funciona contra este horrible virus. Ahora bien, un fármaco llamado cloroquine. Y algunas personas a, a le agra agradarían hidroxi, hidroxil coroquil, hidroxil coroquil. Esto es fármaco que se usa comúnmente contra la malaria y también es un fármaco utilizado para artritis uh, crítica, alguien que tenga artritis crítica. También utiliza esto de una forma un poco diferente, pero se conoce como un fármaco contra la malaria. Hace mucho tiempo que se utiliza y es muy poderoso. Pero lo bueno de todo esto es que hace mucho tiempo se usa. Así que sabemos que, que sí. las cosas no van como se planean, no va a matar a nadie. Cuando uno va con un fármaco nuevo, no se sabe si esto va a ocurrir. Tenemos que ver y tenemos que hacer pruebas largas. Pero esto se ha usado en diferentes formas anteriormente ya. Un fármaco muy poderoso en diferentes formas y ha demostrado unos, unos resultados muy, muy, muy alentadores. Y vamos nosotros a poder a tener disponible ese fármaco casi inmediatamente. Ahí es donde el FDA está maravilloso. Ellos han repasado ya el proceso de aprobación, ha sido aprobada, y lo hicieron, lo uh, rebajaron de muchos, muchos meses para su aprobación, ahí inmediatamente se que vamos a poder tener este fármaco disponible por receta médica o por estado. Hablé con el senador Cuomo sobre esto uh, largamente ayer, uh, y él quiere, él quiere ser el primero en fila para obtenerla. Así que yo creo que eso es un, una promesa. Tremenda, tremenda, en base a los resultados uh, y otras pruebas. Uh, es una promesa muy extremadamente prometedor. Normalmente el FDA va a tomar mucho tiempo probar algo semejante. Y fue aprobado muy, pero muy rápidamente. Y ahora está aprobado por receta médica. Y en los individuos, en estados individuales van a hacerle frente a esto. Uh, los médicos se encargarán de esto, los estados se encargarán de esto. Estado por estado, yo creo que va a ser, creo que va a ser maravilloso. Entonces, rápidamente estamos estudiando este fármaco y continuando estudiando, eh, estudiando, pero también vamos a llevar a cabo estos estudios eh, al dárselo a grandes grupos de personas, quizás en Nueva York y otros sitios. Eh, lo estudiaremos ahí. Hay terapias prometedoras eh, producidas por Gilead y ese es Remdesivir. Ese es un fármaco utilizado para otros propósitos que ya se ha lanzado y es tenido resultados para otros usos, pero solía tener un buen resultado con este virus. Ese fármaco también ha sido 
aprobado, está próximo de aprobarse en este caso por parte del FDA y no le puedo decir cuánto le agradecemos lo que el FDA está haciendo, esta gente son increíbles patriotas y el trabajo que Stephen Hunt está haciendo, doctor Hunt es uno de los médicos más respetados en el país, le quiero decir, cuando lo le dimos ese cargo, le dije que quieres hacer algo como esto y nunca sabíamos que esto que ocurrió aquí iba a ocurrir, pero él en sí ha dicho presente, donde que sea que estés ¿dónde estás? lo has hecho le daría la mano, pero no le puedo dar la mano me meto mucho problemas si hago esto, pero él ha sido fantástico y el doctor va a hablar después que yo termine así que Regeneron de nuevo y uh, es una empresa que ha tenido un resultado fantástico, como yo entiendo, según entiendo, con el ébola y otras cosas más. Gran compañía y ellos tienen, eh, son muy prometedores. Tienen Rendezvous y tienen uh, Cloroquine eh, hidro, Hidroxilcloroquine. Esas son uh, dos uh, que ahora ya se han presentado y están esencialmente aprobadas para el uso prescrito por prescripción médica. Y creo que puede ser muy emocionante, creo que puede ser el que cambia las cosas. Y quizás no, quizás no, pero yo creo que puede ser en base a lo que yo he oído, puede que cambie las cosas. Muy poderosas, muy poderosas. Así que quiero que todos los estudiantes sepan que estamos haciendo todo lo posible. Todo lo posible. Y estas acciones son importantes. Próximos pasos. Uh, uh, y el FDA ha actuado como ha actuado con esta velocidad. Es algo increíble. Normalmente dirían ellos, bueno, podemos tenerla para el próximo año, podemos tenerla de aquí a dos años. ¿Entiende? Esta es la manera en la cual normalmente toma años y años y años. Y lo hicieron inmediatamente en base al hecho de que ha sido usado para otras cosas asuntos totalmente no relacionados. Queremos que estos terapéuticos y otros bajo evaluación en estos momentos han de probar, han de probablemente darle alivio a muchos estadounidenses. Esperamos que esto sea así. Esto puede ser una, algo extremadamente innovador, algo extremadamente innovador, con gran resultado. Y también estamos trabajando por una vacuna que tanto necesitamos en el futuro. Como dije ya, lo que estamos haciendo con el FDA es tan emocionante en tantos otros campos, tantas cosas están ocurriendo. Es un momento muy emocionante para medicina. Y le agradecemos al pueblo estadounidense que se ha unido. Están De verdad quedamos en sus hogares. Y creo que hay un espíritu tremendo en este país, un espíritu como muchas personas nunca han visto. Estas personas nunca han visto algo así desde hace mucho tiempo. Y esto significa que los demócratas republicanos están uniéndose. Espero que todo vaya bien en el Capitolio. Quizás no debo decir esto hasta que verifique lo que está ocurriendo, porque nunca se sabe. Pero creo que eh, hay un gran... Um, bueno, los demócratas, los republicanos, del resto, se están uniendo, están tratando de lograr las cosas. Pero mucho más importante, el pueblo estadounidense ha sido increíble. Tomamos la mejor economía que teníamos y le dijimos, deténganse, no pueden trabajar, tienen que quedarse en sus casas, ¿saben? Nunca ha habido un caso como este. Normalmente uno paga mucho dinero para que las cosas anden, funcionen. Ahora estamos pagando mucho dinero para detener las cosas porque no queremos que las personas estén reunidas juntas que este virus no uh, continúe adelante. Nunca ha habido algo semejante a esto en la historia. Nunca ha habido. No, nadie jamás ha visto algo como esto. Pero estamos actuando correctamente. Tenemos que eliminarlo. Y nuestra gran guerra no es, no es una guerra financiera, económica. Es una guerra, es una guerra médica. Tenemos que ganar esta guerra. Es muy importante. Ahora, con esto, quiero ahora, sin más que decir, quiero presentar al doctor Stephen Hahn. Y, uh, de nuevo, él uh, quisiera dar las gracias a Steven y a todas las personas que trabajan en el FDA que son personas fantásticamente talentosas, le agradecemos muchísimo lo que han hecho especialmente a la velocidad de la rapidez con la cual llevaron estos dos elementos dos, estos dos fármacos tan importantes aprobados, muchas gracias gracias señor presidente quiero dar las gracias a usted por su liderazgo durante este brote de coronavirus, gracias por las palabras tan amables sobre el personal del FDA tenemos 10.000 hombres y mujeres de ciencia médicos y otros trabajando 24 horas al día para ayudar al pueblo estadounidense en esta lucha contra el coronavirus. Y esa palabra se la agradecemos de corazón, señor. Así que antes que el presidente me lo mirara a mí y yo fuese confirmado como el comisionado de, de fármacos, 
era un médico que trataba el cáncer y yo estuve con muchísimos pacientes y tenía que hablar con ellos sobre su diagnóstico y su tratamiento y algo que de verdad era importante para mí era darle esperanza. Tengo gran esperanza de cómo vamos a salir de esta situación. También es importante no dar esperanzas falsas, pero dar esperanza. Como médico, eh, yo veo hablando ahora al pueblo estadounidense como comisionado de fármacos y esa parte de mí no me ha dejado. Veamos la manera en la cual el pueblo estadounidense ha respondido a nuestra llamado a mitigación, distanciamiento social. El pueblo estadounidense rebota muy bien uh, y me siento orgulloso de cómo ha respondido el pueblo, respondido el pueblo estadounidense. El presidente mencionó que fuésemos firmes para tener nuevas innovaciones y desarrollar tratamientos que salven vida. Estamos haciendo esto en el FDA. El FDA está comprometido a continuar dando seguridad regulatoria. Pero quiero esclarecer algo. También tenemos una responsabilidad con el pueblo estadounidense para asegurarnos que los productos son seguros y eficaces ¿eh? y que estemos y estamos continuando haciendo esto. Nuestra gente y son sus profesionales tremendos están trabajando día y noche para lograr esto. No se pueden imaginar ustedes cuánto están trabajando ellos para darle este apoyo al pueblo estadounidense. Y le agradezco a ellos. Desde el principio de enero, mucho antes que el primer caso doméstico, el FDA comenzó a trabajar en comparación con el CDC. Quiero decir que nosotros tenemos un grupo de comando que hemos estado centrándonos en el coronavirus desde el principio de esta emergencia de salud pública. Esto es... Esto es una manera de una manera que estamos abordando esto, todo el gobierno y todos los estadounidenses eh, con gran eh, hechos terapéuticos. Y gran parte del trabajo eso es desarrollar las opciones terapéuticas asociadas con el coronavirus. Y hemos aprendido con nuestros colegas en todos los confines del mundo sobre esto. Pero quiero centrarme en algo. Yo sé, como investigador sobre cáncer antes de eso, hay algo que yo sé de este gran país nuestro, es que nosotros tenemos una energía increíble. Tenemos personas que todos los días cumplen con su responsabilidad de desarrollar tratamientos para todo tipo de enfermedades. Estamos increíblemente, somos increíblemente benditos como país de poder tener esto. Y como ocurre siempre, estos innovadores estadounidenses académicos del sector privado nos han preguntado sobre las mejores opciones para el tratamiento. Estamos estudiando todo lo que se nos presenta como opciones posibles para el tratamiento de coronavirus. Estamos muy alentados por el interés y los esfuerzos que hemos visto de estos grandes innovadores estadounidenses. Ahora, una vez más, cuando lo estudiamos, necesitamos datos e información para hacer las mejores decisiones posibles a favor del pueblo. Pero quiero asegurarle que tenemos más de 17.000 personas en la FDA que están haciendo esto día tras día. Tenemos que asegurarnos que este mar de nuevos tratamientos eh, nos dé el fármaco correcto para el paciente correcto a la dosificación correcta en el momento correcto. A modo de ejemplo, hoy tenemos el fármaco correcto, pero quizás no en la dosificación correcta en los momentos. Y eso puede perjudicar más que beneficiar. Y nosotros tenemos que estudiar eso. Y por eso es importante que tengamos estos profesionales dedicados para estudiar estos aspectos de desarrollo terapéutico. Y a la vez, también estamos trabajando a través de diferentes mecanismos para en sí llevar los fármacos a manos de proveedores y pacientes. El presidente mencionó esto por uno de los mecanismos. Se llama uso con compasión. Permítame decirle de esto. Si hay un fármaco experimental que está en potencia disponible, un médico le pudiera, pudiera pedir que ese fármaco se use en un paciente. Tenemos ciertos criterios y una aprobación muy rápida para esto. Y lo importante sobre el uso con compasión, que lo dijo el presidente, esto va más allá que el derecho a aprobar, es que podemos recopilar la información al respecto, porque una de las cosas que le prometemos al pueblo estadounidense es que vamos a recopilar los datos para tomar las decisiones absolutamente correctas en base a esos datos sobre la eficacia y seguridad de los tratamientos. Estamos trabajando rápidamente para cerciorarnos que estos productos sean eficaces y seguros de la mejor manera posible. Quiero decirles algunas cosas en las cuales estamos trabajando en la actualidad. Este es un plan que fue apoyado con el pueblo del grupo, eh, con el pueblo y el grupo de eh, enfermedades infecciosas. Estamos estudiando fármacos ya aprobados para otras indicaciones. Ya fueron aprobadas, como dijo el presidente, para otras enfermedades. A modo de ejemplo, muchos estadounidenses han leído estudios y han escuchado reportes de, en los medios de este fármaco llamado cloroquine, que es un fármaco contra la malaria. Ya fue aprobado, como dijo el presidente, para el tratamiento de la malaria también y artritis y padecimientos de artritis. Es un fármaco que el presidente nos ha instruido que estudiemos de para ver si el uso de esta se puede lograr para ver si este beneficia a los pacientes del coronavirus. Si queremos hacer esto en ensayos clínicos, un, este, esta, eh, un ensayo clínico pragmático grande para recopilar la información y responder a la pregunta que hay que responder. 
hacer es responder. Permítanme otro ejemplo. Hay un esfuerzo cross-agencia sobre algo llamado plasma convaleciente. Esto es algo muy emocionante también y esto es algo que nosotros uh, uh, hemos ayudado a otros países con esto al desarrollarse esta crisis. El FDA lleva tiempo trabajando con esto. Si usted ha sido expuesto al coronavirus y está mejor, no tiene el virus ya en su sangre, podemos recopilar la sangre suya. Este es un tratamiento posible. Es un tratamiento probado, se lo quiere recopilar. Re recaudar eh, la sangre, obtener la sangre. Una vez que esté libre del virus y patógenos, podemos darle a su sangre a otros pacientes para que se desarrolle inmunoglobulina y el, la respuesta inmunológica puede ser beneficiosa a otros pacientes. También estas próximas semanas tenemos más sobre esto. Estamos estudiando hasta ahora, estamos tratando de acelerar este estudio. Esto es a medio y corto plazo. Eso será un empalme y otras terapias que nos llevará de tres a seis meses para desarrollar. Y esto es un proceso continuo. No hay principio y fin a cada una de estas. Estamos eh, eh, trabajando sobre esto, pero algo más sobre estos grandes innovadores de los Estados Unidos. Algunos nos dicen que ha tomado años, años, desarrollar terapias. Ahora están estudiando esto para poder lograrlo en meses nada más. Estamos tratando de tener la flexibilidad regulatoria, pero a la vez que tener supervisión científica para que esto se logre de la mejor manera posible para el pueblo estadounidense. El presidente mencionó que hay un ensayo de vacuna ya en la actualidad que se está llevando a cabo. Es un ensayo fase 1, es un estudio precoz. Se puede tomar de 12 meses para poder tener esta vacuna, para que se pueda probar esta. Pero estas son cosas para empalmar, para eh, prevenir esto con una vacuna. Se trabaja emocionante y el presidente está en lo cierto. Esto se está haciendo con una rapidez como nunca antes en el desarrollo de la vacuna. Es una sociedad un importante del de, de, sector privado y público. Eh, queremos tener acceso a tiempo para que las agencias respetadas en todo el mundo con estándares de oro que confían en datos firmes de ensayos clínicos para poder determinar si un fármaco experimental o fármaco que se usa para otros tratamientos puede tratar a los pacientes de coronavirus fielmente. Queremos asesorar al pueblo sonodense que el FDA está trabajando con todos sus esfuerzos, como mencionó el presidente, trabajando nosotros con los patrocinadores para ayudar a, a hacer todo esto rápidamente. Queremos permanecernos rápidamente trabajando para desarrollar un tratamiento eficaz contra el coronavirus. Muchas gracias. Gracias a ti, Mike. Gracias, señor presidente. El, el grupo extraordinario de coronavirus de la Casa Blanca se reunió esta mañana, este primer día de la primavera. Continuamos nosotros haciendo progreso firme a favor del objetivo del presidente Trump solamente para unir todos los recursos del gobierno federal, el gobierno estatal y todos los funcionarios locales y estatales de salubridad y también usar el poder del sector privado estadounidense. Las actividades de estos últimos días reflejan todas estas prioridades. Ayer el presidente habló con los médicos principales y enfermeras de Estados Unidos y recopiló información eh, favorable para determinar cómo mejor podemos servir nosotros a aquellos que sirven a los estadounidenses que tienen, padecen el coronavirus. También tuvimos una llamada productiva con más de 5.000 funcionarios locales, estatales y locales eh, para hacerles saber que tenemos una asociación fuerte sin uh, problema alguno con todos los médicos en todos los territorios. Ayer el, el, el presidente aprobó la gratis, pruebas gratis de coronavirus para darle asistencia médica también, asistencia de pagos y una gama amplia de beneficios para aquellos que padecen del coronavirus. Y como dijo el presidente un día, esperamos que el, el Capitolio comience a trabajar sobre un paquete de alivio económico para el pueblo. Más tarde, el presidente y yo nos vamos a reunir de nuevo en una teleconferencia con los gobernadores uh, de los estados. Nos reuniremos nosotros en el Centro de Coordinación de FEMA para desglosar la decisión del presidente. Trump para que FEMA sea el líder en nuestra respuesta nacional contra el coronavirus. Nuestra respuesta nacional a través de FEMA se hará llevar a cabo. Lo... Los sepan una vez más que las pruebas están disponibles en todos los 50 estados. Ya está disponible más y más con cada hora del día que pasa, debido a la asociación pública privada que inició el presidente hace varias semanas con laboratorios principales. Hoy día he recibido un informe que decenas de millares de pruebas se están llevando a cabo todos los días y 
con la aprobación de la legislación de anoche, los laboratorios estados y privados, ahora se le exige la ley que reporten todas las pruebas de coronavirus directamente al CDC, que le dará al pueblo estadounidense y también a nuestros investigadores información a tiempo rápida e importante. Es importante que todos los estadounidenses recuerden que si no tienen síntomas, no necesitan tener una prueba. Queremos cerciorarnos que las pruebas están disponibles para aquellas personas que tienen síntomas o que tienen una preocupación genuina sobre haber estado expuesto a alguien con el coronavirus. El doctor Brooks también hablará sobre las pruebas eh, que hemos llevado a cabo y los estadounidenses podrán ver cómo los nuevos números de casos uh, en aumento al tener más pruebas no debe ser una causa de preocupación. Ella va a explicar la importancia de tomar en consideración el nuevo sistema de pruebas al obtener nuevos datos en estos próximos días. Con respecto a la uh, provisión, nuestro presidente le ha dado... Uh, importancia a esta fuerza laboral extraordinaria que yo dirijo para que todos puedan tener los uh, uh, dispositivos necesarios disponibles en todos los sectores privados y en todos los estados. Eh, nos sentimos alentados a ver compañías como Honeywell y 3M, que hace unas pocas semanas yo visité, sacando la ventaja a los cambios en la ley. Anoche mismo, por ejemplo, ahora permiten la venta de máscaras industriales directamente a los hospitales. Estas empresas ahora han aumentado grandemente por la de millones la producción de llamadas máscaras N95 que le dará a los trabajadores de salubridad la protección necesaria para poder cuidar de aquellos que tienen los síntomas o la enfermedad de coronavirus. Y después de que se firmó el proyecto de ley anoche, todas esas máscaras ahora tienen una protección contra la responsabilidad civil y las compañías pueden vender máscaras industriales a los hospitales. Es alentador, como dijimos ayer, ver que las compañías de construcción en todos los Estados Unidos de América, que en estos momentos están verificando su abastecimiento y están donando esas máscaras industriales a sus hospitales locales. Yo sé que hablo en nombre del presidente, que ha pasado, pasó mucho tiempo como contratista. Le damos las gracias a los contratistas estadounidenses por trabajar junto con los profesionales de la medicina nuestros. Con respecto a los respiradores pulmonares, estamos trabajando con los proveedores de, medicam de medicamentos y uh, asuntos médicos uh, y hemos identificado ya decenas de millares de respiradores uh, Uh, pulmonares que pueden ser convertidos para tratar a los pacientes y permanecimos con mucha confianza de que tendremos los respiradores necesarios mientras que el coronavirus se desplaza por todos los Estados Unidos. Y como dijimos anteriormente, todos estamos trabajando juntos, todos estamos involucrados en esto. Y antes de dar el podio y el micrófono de vuelta al presidente y a la doctora Birx, quiero pedirle a todos los estadounidenses una vez más a... a los 15 días que dio el pre presidente para disminuir este brote, eh, escuchamos de un caso tras otro, una ciudad tras otra, donde el pueblo está. Acatamos a los principios que el presidente desglosó. Y no se equivoquen, que el pueblo estadounidense en su totalidad tiene un riesgo bajo de contaminarse, pero estas pautas las debe practicar todos los estadounidenses en todas las comunidades, no solamente para amortiguar la diseminación del coronavirus, pero para proteger a los más vulnerables entre nosotros. Los estadounidenses de sus corazones no solamente están acatando ciertos principios de distanciamiento social, evitando reuniones sociales de más de 10 personas, utilizando eh, eh, los para buscar comida en los restaurantes, para protegerse a sí mismo y a su familia. También están reconociendo que ningún estadounidense quiere uh, darle el coronavirus a alguien eh, cuya consecuencia puede ser muy seria. Bajo la instrucción del presidente, continuaremos nosotros usando todos los recursos del gobierno a todos los niveles. Vamos a estar reiterando esta asociación fuerte con los estados estadounidenses esta tarde, con los gobernadores estadounidenses, uniendo toda la energía del sector privado, la innovación que ustedes acaban de escuchar, de escribir. Yo sé que este primer día de primavera pasaremos por esto. Esto será algo del pasado junto. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Gracias. Doctora Brock, oh, gracias. Gracias, señor presidente. Yo sé que ustedes están viendo los datos cuidadosamente, como ustedes pueden ver, el aumento drástico en el número de casos nuevos en base al poder hacerle pruebas a personas adicionales. Ahora, esto de continuar los próximos dos o tres días, al comenzar nosotros a, a reducir los atrasos de las pruebas, todos han escuchado eh, que las personas estaban esperando cuatro o cinco días para el resultado de las pruebas. Ahora, todo eso se está avanzando rápidamente. Estamos también haciéndole pruebas a muchos individuos. Quiero aplaudir a los médicos y enfermeras profesionales de la medicina y a aquellos que hacen las pruebas que han dado prioridad y a 
los estadounidenses que tienen síntomas, el número de pruebas positivas ha aumentado. Eso es una firma importantísima de que todos están cumpliendo con su labor, todos con síntomas leves están quedándose en la casa, aislándose a sí mismo. Aquellos con síntomas serios están presentando para que se le haga la prueba. Ahora tenemos una de una alza de 10 a 11 de alza en pruebas positivas. Yo sé que muchos de ustedes están estudiando ahora los datos a nivel estatal, aún más de 50% de los casos provienen de tres estados. Esta es la razón por la cual continuamos nosotros dándole prioridad a los estados esos con las pruebas. Además, 50% de los estados vienen de los casos, vienen de 10 condados. Somos un gran país con muchísimos condados y quiero aplaudir yo a los gobiernos locales y estatales que están implementando sus operaciones de centros de ciencia. Y quiero también dar las gracias a los trabajadores de salud que le han pedido que reduzcan todas las cirugías electivas, visitas quirúrgicas y dentales. Esto ha de aumentar drásticamente el número de respiradores pulmonares disponibles en los hospitales, en centros ambulatorios quirúrgicos que pueden ser convertidos y utilizados. Y también gracias a la industria de construcción. Estamos profundamente agradecidos, como dijo el vicepresidente, el número de individuos que se han presentado con sus máscaras de construcción, sus tines y sus máscaras para contribuirlas al sector de atención médica. La petición del presidente que entregaran esto y la legislación cambia. Ahora... El, el juego y inmediatamente tenemos un aumento de 75 a 90% de aumentos eh, de máscaras y botines eh, debido a que se, son utilizados comúnmente en la de construcción. Gracias, gracias, señor presidente y señor vicepresidente. Hoy día ustedes escucharon un anuncio maravilloso de parte del FDA. Quiero yo aplaudir al doctor Han y a aquellos del FDA, y donde hay varios centenares de comisionados por mí trabajando. Tiene razón, señor presidente, son incansables. Están haciendo cosas como nunca antes para aportarlas y llevar al pueblo estadounidense los mejores avances. Pero quiero hablar de algo diferente brevemente. Sabemos que muchos de ustedes están en la casa practicando las pautas del presidente de distanciamiento social, pero algo que todos debemos de considerar, especialmente nuestra juventud de mil es el donar sangre como anestesiólogo que aún ejercen Walter Reed cuidando de nuestros veteranos heridos y los soldados. Yo sé que la sangre donada es una parte esencial del cuidado de los pacientes y una donación puede salvar hasta tres vidas. Los centros para donación de sangre están abiertos a todos y necesitan su donación. Quiero que los estadounidenses sepan que el donar sangre es seguro y se está tomando precauciones adicionales en nuevas recomendaciones de parte del CDC. Este fue un informe especial de Noticias Univisión. To make appointments ahead of time so we can space them out. Social distancing does not have to mean social disengagement. So give blood today. You'll feel good about it, and you'll be helping your country and your community during this crisis. And you might even save a life. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, please. Go ahead, Mr. President, uh, switching to the, uh, the the efforts to boost the economy with the measures before Congress, will you guarantee that the money, the billions, the tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars even that's going to go uh, to these industries will not go to executive bonuses or to more stock buybacks? Well, we don't want that. In fact, some companies, as you know, did stock buybacks, and I was never happy with that. Uh, it's very hard to tell them not to, but I would tell them not to. I would say I don't like it for that reason. Some did, and it turned out that they could have waited a long time. They would have been much better off if they didn't. Uh, you can make it a condition of the bill. You can say that none of this money can go I wouldn't for that. I'm making, uh, I mean, you know, it takes uh, many, many people in this case to tango. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, that uh, conditions like that would be okay with me. Mr. John? President. Mr. President, if I could a question for you and then a question for Dr. Hahn. Uh, you enabled, I guess is probably the best way to put it, the Defense Production Act yesterday, but you haven't pulled the trigger on it. No, because we hope we're not going to need that. You're getting a lot of calls on Capitol Hill from the Democratic leadership to pull the trigger on it. Why, why, what's the rationale for not doing it? Uh, first of all, governors are supposed to be doing a lot of this work, and they are doing a lot of this work. The federal government's not supposed to be out there buying vast amounts of items and then shipping. You know, we're not a shipping clerk. Uh, the governors are supposed to be, as with testing, the governors are supposed, are supposed to be doing it. 
uh, we'll help out, and we'll help out wherever we can. And we can buy in volume, and in some cases, great volume, uh, with the masks, as an example, which were really a problem. We have helped out, and there are right now millions of masks being made. But this is really for the local governments, governors, and people within the state, depending on the way they divide it up. And they'll do that, and they're doing a very good job of it. Uh, where you have a problem with ventilators, we're working very hard trying to find nobody in their wildest dreams would have ever thought that we need tens of thousands of ventilators. This is something that's very unique to this, to what happened. Under what conditions would you put the Defense Production Act into action? Well, if we were desperately in need of something, and we frankly uh, will know about that very shortly, we want to be ahead of — we don't want to do it as it happens, but before it happens, uh, we're going to know a lot over the next two or three days. We'll know a lot. For Dr. Oh, for Dr. Dr. President. Dr. Hahn? Um, any idea when remdesivir will be available uh, to the market? And are there any drugs in the pipeline that you believe could qualify for a treatment IMD? So with respect to the first question, um, I'm prohibited by law to disclose confidential commercial information. What I can tell you is we're working very closely with the company on this, and we'll have additional information. They will um, relatively soon. Yes, there are drugs in the pipeline. Um, we're looking at every one. Everyone on this dais gets calls every day, as do all of our people at the FDA, about potential therapeutic options. We are looking at every single one of them. Okay. Two questions for you. One on coronavirus, but just really quickly. Are you confirming that Austin Tice is still alive? No, I'm not, but uh, we're trying to find that out. This has been going on for years. Many years they've been trying to find Austin Tice. Uh, he was in Syria, as you know. His mother is an incredible woman. And I'm doing it uh, for him, but I'm doing it for his mother. His mother's an incredible woman who's desperate to find her son. And uh, I'm not confirming alive, but if, if he is alive, we would like very much to get him back quickly. Okay. And on coronavirus, um, speaking of shortages of supplies, the CDC has put out guidelines for hospitals that are dealing with a shortage of masks to use them beyond their shelf life, reuse them instead of getting new ones, and in a worst-case scenario, use a bandana instead of a mask. How is that acceptable at all? Well, I haven't seen that, but I will uh, let Mike answer that question, Vice President. I'm happy to, Mr. President. I just — I can't emphasize enough uh, the incredible progress that was made with the passage of the legislation last night. Uh, the President had me go to Minnesota and meet with 3M that manufactures these uh, N95 masks a few weeks ago. And we learned of their production at that facility of 35 million masks a month. Uh, uh, less than 5 million of those were qualified to be sold to hospitals. So the President worked with Republican and Democrat leadership. We've extended the liability protection. So now that all the industrial masks that are manufactured as N95s are now available to hospitals, and we're seeing a dramatic uh, increase in production. Honeywell alone is repurposing a factory that was destined for Mexico to produce another 120 million masks per year. 3M is increasing output to 420 million masks per year. Uh, we really uh, — we've put a priority at the President's direction on making sure those that are providing health care services to America have the protection to keep themselves and their families safe. Uh, and with the legislation last night, with the incredible response, among these great private sector companies, and, as we mentioned repeatedly, with construction companies around America heeding the President's call to donate their industrial mass to hospitals. It's happening all over America. We know we'll meet that need. But when will those be so, ready? Isn't that so kind of how many sad masks if you're are being made, and when will they be ready? Or at least we start getting them ready? Well, as I mentioned, uh, 3M is increasing their output to $420 million a year. At, at production in January, they make $35 million per month at that facility. And uh, uh, we're, we're prioritizing the distribution of those. But the other thing, and we'll emphasize this with governors this afternoon, is we're working with governors to make sure that the health care providers, the hospitals, and the clinics in their state are placing orders now that this tremendous increase in supply, particularly with industrial mass, is now available. We're going to make sure they understand that the supply has greatly expanded, thanks to a bipartisan legislation and the accomplishment of the President. And the response by these companies is making more masks available. And we're going to make sure health care providers are purchasing those. Uh, and the Federal Government will also make sure that our stockpile is 
properly reflects those increases as well. So, so the, president's president's question, question, the, will, uh, on the President's question, when will those masks be ready for, because they need them like today. Uh, they're available now. Uh, the 3M facility that I was at told me that in, that in January they went to full production on 35 million masks. The legislative change means that all 35 million of those that started to be produced at full capacity in January can now be sold to hospitals. That's the distinction here. It's a very important change, and it's part of the way the President has been engaging the private sector, pushing the kind of regulatory reform and the kind of li liability reform that ex has greatly expanded uh, the availability of masks. So they're in the marketplace now. We're going to make it clear to governors, as, as we made it clear to health care providers in conference calls yesterday, that those resources are now there. We vastly increased the supply of medical masks, and we're going to continue to put a priority on making sure that we're calling on industry at every level, calling on major suppliers that the President met with this week, to make sure that those personal protective equipment are there. Some for of that had to do with the liability to the company. They had a big problem with liability, and uh, much of it had to do with the liability to the company. So why does the why does the Mr. President, thank you. Two for you and one for Dr. Hahn. The American Hospital Association just told NBC News that they need $100 billion in order to address shortages in equipment and other infrastructure there. You just signed two legislative packages. They say it didn't directly give money to address this issue. Why not? And will you commit to making we're sure they We're looking at that issue directly with them, and uh, that's a separate issue, but we're looking at that issue very directly. We make sure and We're looking at it very directly. Well, we're going to do our best on it, but uh, we're working with Democrats and Republicans on that. We're looking at that very specifically. Can you bottom line, people, when can Americans expect their lives to go back to normal? Will that not happen until there's yeah. a vaccine? I Mr. hope very soon. We'll see. Uh, this is uncharted territory, as you know. Uh, we think we have ideas. It doesn't help to say what the ideas are. I would hope very soon. We're, uh, we're we pull together as a nation. People are, for the most part, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, the social distancing is very interesting, a whole new term that's become a hot — it's become somewhat of a hot term, but people are listening, and they're — and they're really doing a great job. This country is an amazing country. Uh, I think you're up to 141 different countries right now, so it's very uncharted territory. It could have — could have been stopped. could have been stopped pretty easily if we had known — if everybody had known about it uh, a number of months before people started reading President, about it. You said you didn't Excuse know me. Excuse me. Uh, before we started reading about it. We could have — it could have been stopped in its tracks. Unfortunately, they didn't decide to make it public. But uh, the whole world is suffering because of it. You did say a few days ago, though, you did have a sense that this was a pandemic that was coming. So why was the United States not prepared with more testing? We were very supplies? prepared. Uh, the only thing we weren't prepared for was the uh, — the media. The media has not treated it fairly. I'll tell you how prepared I was. Uh, I called for a ban from people coming in from China long before anybody thought it was — in fact, it was your network. I believe they called me a racist because I did that. Uh, it was many of the people in the room, they called me racist and other words uh, because I did that, because I went so early. So when you say we weren't prepared, had I let these tens of thousands of people come in from China a day, we would have had something right now that would have been uh, — you wouldn't have even recognized it compared to where we are. How many people have passed away? How many people have died as of this moment? You could multiply that by a factor of many, many, many. So when you say that I wasn't prepared, I was the first one to do the ban. Now other countries are following what I did. But the media doesn't acknowledge well, that. Well, they they know it's true. They know it's true, but they don't want to write about it. Yeah, go ahead. Thomas, Thomas, questions, questions, and then I asked one for, for the medical questions. professionals. Um, I wanted to just follow up on, on John and Caitlin's question. So it's not just masks. Doctors are saying now that they are desperate for other personal protective gear, gloves, uh, other equipment. Uh, governors are saying that they don't have access to respirators, and they're terrified. What is your reticence about it? Governors the are supposed to get it. The states are supposed to get it, but we're helping the states. Well, look, for years they bought them, and now all of a sudden they're coming to the federal oh, yeah. government. We're working with the states. We're working with the governors. We're working with everybody. The relationships are great. One of the things that happened this morning, I spoke with Mickey Arison of Carnival Cruise Lines, and he is going to make ships available. So in addition to the big medical ships that you have coming, if we should need ships with lots of rooms, 
Uh, they'll be docked at New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco, different places. So I want to thank Mickey Harris, and that's Carnival Cruise Lines. What is your reticence about invoking the defense production? I've done it. That you I've don't done it. Yeah, it. if if we find that we need something, that we will do that. And you don't know what we've done. You don't know whether or not we've ordered. You don't know if we've invoked it. You don't know what's been ordered, what's not been ordered. I can only tell you. I can only tell you that, uh, as an example, masks. Nobody ever heard of the number of masks that's been ordered. They're being made now, and many are available now. Uh, but people, I think, in the media probably don't know that. Uh, go ahead, beyond. Thank you. Could you explain the gap in, for the American people and what you're saying here today about there being tens of thousands of tests available, about how there being a huge amount of masks available, and what we're seeing on the ground, which is really the opposite of that. People are, people are saying that they can't get tested even when they have symptoms. People are saying that they, doctors are telling us they don't have access to, to vital equipment. Can you explain that, that gap? Uh, well, I can't. I, I cannot explain a gap. I'm hearing very good things on the ground, and we're dealing with love. They had to ramp up. They had an obsolete system, and they had a system simultaneously that was not meant for this. It wasn't meant for this. Nobody knew there'd be a pandemic or an epidemic of this proportion. Nobody's ever seen anything like this before. Uh, I can tell you that what we're doing is we're working with local governments, with states, governors, even mayors, uh, on getting them to be able to get what they need. And the system is starting to work out very well. But we had to break a system, like breaking an egg, because the system we had was obsolete and didn't work. And that was a system we inherited. And now we have something that's really been very good and certainly going to be great for the future, too. Yeah, please. Mr. President, there seems to be a backlash building among congressional Republicans and then your supporters about uh, a corporate bailout. Um, in particular, uh, Senator Mike Braun said that this could harken back to 2008, where we're picking winners and losers, and he indicated that he and some of his colleagues may not be comfortable with that. What do you say to that? Well, we don't want to pick winners and losers. We want everybody to benefit. We want, I think, more than anything else, the workers to benefit. And sometimes for the worker to benefit, you have to go through the company, because they have thousands of workers. And if the company goes out of business, no fault of their own, those workers aren't going to be able to receive a check. So we're uh, look, our ultimate goal are the people. Our ultimate goal are the great people of this country. And uh, we will have things worked out, I think, that are going to be very well. It's a very complex formula. You understand that. It's very complex. But it's working out. I think it's going to be very well. I think we're going to have pretty uniform support for it. Please. Mr. President, that, we're hearing the State Department is going to put out an advisory telling Americans not to travel overseas at all. Are you putting in an overseas travel ban? We're, we're speaking with the State Department later. I, I can't say right now because I haven't had the meeting yet. Thank you, President Trump. I wanted to ask Dr. Hahn about today's announcement, if I could. Yes, Dr. Hahn, thank you so much. I wanted to ask about Rem Remsevier, if I hope I pronounced that correctly. Can you t say, is it currently approved for use on the virus? Uh, so Remdesivir, um, and it's a drug made by Gilead, that's been in the press. Um, it is currently in clinical trials here and around the world. We have also made it available by that approach that I told you called compassionate use, where a doctor could ask the FDA for that. And the really positive thing about that, that gives it rapidly to a doctor and a patient, but it allows us to collect the data because what we really need to do is understand what the data and science are in order to make the appropriate decision about safety and, and eff effectiveness. So how do you just make sure that it is safe? And I mean, is there any concern at all that it will be safe, considering that it's not going through the normal uh, process and, and could potentially cause negative effects? Dr. Fauci earlier talked about we do not want to put out anything that could cause negative effects. Is there any concern about those kind of things with, with this drug? Sir? Yeah, thank you for that question, because I just want to be clear about this. Um, remdesivir is going through the normal process. We are using our internal processes at FDA to set up with the company the protocols to actually collect the data. And you're right. We need to actually know about the safety and the effectiveness, and that's done through the clinical trial process. So it's those data that are going to inform the decisions that are ultimately made about safety and eff efficacy. This is um, an unprecedented situation. This is a, a really significant time. And one thing that, um, with the President's leadership, FDA has done is said, okay, 
How do we approach these extraordinary times with extraordinary measures, knowing that we have a sacred trust with the American people about safety and efficacy, but still at the same time enable these treatments to, to get into patients? And that's what we're doing. Jeff, uh, Mr. President, one for you and one for the doctors. How likely is it that the 15-day guidance that you have, have put through will be extended? I can only tell you on the 14th day. And we'll have to see. We'll, we'll have indications later on. Dr. Burks indicated that there are three states and 10 counties, if I got that right, where 50 percent of the cases are focused. Should those areas be doing more measures such as shelter in place? I think they actually are doing a lot. I mean, they, I, I know New York is, is working very diligently, been very strong. Uh, I assume San Francisco is one of the areas and Los Angeles and the uh, state of Washington, obviously, that's uh, one that has to be up there. Uh, they're all working very hard to to uh, quarantine, uh, or words just about the equivalent of quarantine. Okay? What is your plan, sir, for government workers? Are you moving for the government as well to start doing more teleworking? Uh, we are, and we're doing. Uh, we're using uh, the medical term of telemedicine, and it's been incredibly busy and really, you know, where people don't have to. I mean, some people can't do it anyway. They can't get up. They can't see a doctor. But we're using this, and it's been telehealth, different names. And I will tell you that it's been really successful. It's helped a lot of people out where they don't have to, and they can't. And even from a safety reason, if they are uh, positive, they are, if they are feeling poorly, uh, they can't do it, or we don't want them transmitting anything to anybody else. Mr. President, uh, Mr. President if I could, uh, on, on China, they reported for the first time since the outbreak uh, no new cases over a 24-hour period. Do you have any reason to disbelieve them? And second to that, uh, the National Security Council yesterday put out a tweet very critical of the Chinese government saying the Chinese Communist Party suppressed initial reports on the Chinese virus and punished doctors and journalists causing Chinese and international experts to miss critical opportunities to prevent a global pandemic. Could you explain Well, that? it would have been much better uh, if we had known about this a number of months earlier. It could have been contained to that one area in China where it started. And certainly, uh, the world is paying a big price for what they did, and the uh, world is paying a very big price for not for not letting them come out. Everybody knows that. We all know that. Uh, as far as as far as uh, believing what they're putting out now, I hope it's true. Who knows? But I hope it's true. I did really do. Uh, quickly, uh, a question for you, and then also for the doctor, if possible. Um, you've been talking about China quite a bit, and you've been talking about the the Chinese virus. Uh, how if you had heard about this on day one and had more information, possibly you could have stopped it. Big difference. Are you thinking about any types of repercussions for China? And are you also rethinking sort of the supply lines uh, for our manufacturing industry? I don't want to comment on that right now. Yeah. Mr. President, I have a question for you and also a question for Dr. Burks. If you, um, uh, American workers across the country are losing their jobs at an unprecedented rate, and your former economist said we could see some of the worst job numbers ever. Is the government prepared um, to see this spike in unemployment? You no. Know, worst case scenario, you would have terrible job numbers. If we can get this thing wrapped up and finished earlier, uh, things will go very nicely. And one of the things they're working, as you know, one of the elements uh, that is being worked on very much so in the Hill is to keep the jobs going so that when we do get rid of the virus, we're going to be able to just really, I think, go like a rocket. I think the economy is going to be fantastic. Now, when he said that, uh, he was using that as the ultimate bad outcome. I don't think anybody believes that's going to happen. Go ahead. Uh, members of Congress uh, are now being uh, tested positive for — members of Congress are now being tested positive for coronavirus, and we, you have almost two dozen who are self-quarantining. Do you um, have any guidance for Congress? Should they — I know all of them, and uh, I don't know if they're sitting like you people are sitting. You're actually sitting too close. You should really — we should probably get rid of about — another 75, 80 percent of you. I'll have just two or three that I like in this room. I think that's a great way of doing it. We just figured a new way of doing it. Uh, but you're actually much too close. You know, you two, you should leave immediately. But, but look, look, uh, I know all of them. Uh, they tested positive. Hopefully, they're all going to get better. And uh, 
it's one of those things. It's Congress. You know, it's one of those things. Should they keep going to the Hill, or should they? Well, I don't think they're going to the Hill. I mean, I know some where, where they tested positive. They're in quarantine. And I know uh, Lindsay and many others are, are they, they didn't test it, but until they got the result, they put themselves in quarantine. A number of people in Congress right now are in quarantine. They don't know the results. When they get the result, they'll either stay there and get better, because people get better. I mean, most people are getting better. Most, by far, the people, are, you get better. Uh, doesn't mean it's not a tough one. It is a tough one. But no, when they, uh, many people in Congress have felt not perfect, or they met somebody that wasn't perfect, it turned out to be positive, and uh, they've put themselves in quarantine. Now, I think they've, I think Congress has behaved unbelievably well in that regard. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President on, on the stimulus, sir, given what is happening to the economy, do you think a trillion-dollar stimulus is enough? We'll know about that uh, later on. We'll see what happens. And it depends how long. So much depends on what's going on in this room in terms of uh, the medical. If we can stop it in its tracks, the virus, uh, it's plenty. If we can't, we'll have to go back and talk. Do you, do you support the idea of the government taking an equity stake in certain companies? <clears throat> I do. I really do. Which companies are you? I, I'm not going to say, but I think so. Look, people are coming. People are coming in for money. Uh, in some cases, no fault of their own. But in some cases, uh, where they did certain things over the course of the years, including buy, buying back stock, you know, they bought back stock, and they paid a high price for it, as it turned out. Uh, but uh, maybe I view that as a little bit differently than somebody that didn't, and somebody that built plants all over the United States, of which there were plenty of them, too. Airlines or Boeing, or what, what are you thinking uh, of? We will be helping the airline industry. We will be helping the cruise ship industry. We probably will be helping the hotel industry. We'll probably be where, — where jobs are created. You don't want to lose industries like this. These are incredible industries. You can't lose them. So we'll be focused on many industries. And I have to say, I can't say it strongly enough, we will be helping small businesses. That's where it's complicated, because there's a lot of small — you know, that's the engine of the — of the country. We will be helping small businesses. Dr. Hahn, Mr. President, these two members of Congress that have um, tested positive for COVID-19, what's the status of these will be votes that you need to pass this $1 trillion stimulus package for the economy. Um, do you expect this to slow down the delivery of checks for American families? And are you considering any no. executive action? Uh, there could be. We're looking at a couple of things that I could do. Hopefully, we won't need it, but we can do. Was, there's a lot speaking? of executive power. Uh, if we don't have to use it, that would be a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, one for you, and potentially as well, one for either Dr. Burks or Dr. Adams. Right now, the economy is essentially ground to a halt. Thanks for Sto telling us. We appreciate it. Stores have closed. Travel yeah. has slowed down. Go ahead. What's the rest of your question? We know that. Everybody in the room knows that. The question is, how long should those who are either not working right now or business owners who have to make critical decisions, how long should they expect the state of affairs as it stands at this moment to play out? And for, for the doctors behind you... We'll be able to tell you that very, I think, in the near future. We'll see where we're going. You're going to see numbers. You've seen the graphs. You're going to see numbers, and we'll be able to let you know. I will say that uh, the American public has been incredible, for the most part. Not in all cases, but for the most part. Uh, so you'll be able to see what's happening over the next. As we say, we had a 15-day period. You'll be able to tell a lot in a week or so. Not everything, but we'll be able to see over a period of time. And for all the parents that are home right now, and this is a question for Dr. Burks or Dr. Adams, who are caring for their children and are curious as to when might my kids be able to go back to school? What do you think is a realistic timeline? Well, I think you know most of — all of those decisions are made at the state and local government level, and each state and local government has handled it differently. That's why we put out from the president federal — federal presidential guidance to every single person about what we think is important for the next two weeks. And as we look at that data, we'll be able to see if it's having an impact. I think you've all seen the modeling studies. Those were driven by the modeling studies showing that if you add these things together, they have a bigger impact than separately. 
And so those are part of the decision making. We had a whole group of modelers in yesterday. They're compositing all the data together to look at this carefully because everyone has those same questions of what the impact will be and what pieces could essentially be removed and you still have the same level of impact in decreasing the spread of the virus. The absolute key to this, though, is every single American looking at the president guidelines and taking it seriously. The acts of selflessness that I am seeing are so impressive across the board. But if even 10 or 15 percent of the population decides that what they're doing today is more important than the health and welfare of the rest of the Americans, they can spread the virus in a very strong way because you know the level of contagion. And, and I have to say, if chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine works, uh, or any of the other things that they're looking at that are not quite as far out. But uh, if they work, uh, your numbers are going to come down very rapidly. So we'll see what happens. But there's a real chance that they might uh, they might work. Go ahead, Thank please. So much, in the back. Thank you so much. Uh, what is your message for some leaders in Latin America, like the president of Brazil, who just on Sunday was taking photos with supporters, encouraging um, a mass demonstration. And just yesterday, a president from Brazil said that we should not be surprised if we see him in the next few days in a crowded subway in Sao Paulo or in a bus in Rio, because he is the president and should build the people. What do you think about that? And what is your message? Well, he's a friend of mine, number one. And number two, we had dinner the other night, and everybody said he was positive, and he wasn't positive. He tested negative. So that was... Uh, I I was quite happy when I heard that. Uh, but I have no message for him other than he's doing a good job in Brazil. How about this? How he's about doing a good job in Brazil, and he's very popular. How about encouraging mass demonstration at this moment? I can't tell you about that. I don't know about that. I, I have not heard that. Uh, he's doing a very good job. Brazil was very troubled before he got there. And uh, he's uh, — the people love him, and it's popular. I think he's doing a very good job. Mr. President, there are Americans who were traveling abroad and were essentially stuck, uh, unable to come home. We spoke to a group of ten, uh, ten women who uh, — Americans. Ten, Where? Where? Uh, well, we spoke to ten American women who were in Morocco, for instance. Uh, all the flights have been canceled. Uh, their hotel is shutting down. They literally have no place to stay and no way to get home. Uh, they uh, are asking you, they're asking the administration, the U.S. government for help. What can yep. be done? We know about it. We have groups. We have a group of young people in, in uh, Peru, and we're working on taking care of that with the military. So military evacuation? Yeah, we're looking to take — no, not evacuation. We're, right. we're trying to get them out. And, uh, you know, they got caught. They were late with their flights. We gave them a period of time. They didn't make it. But we're looking to get them out with military, probably through the military. Uh, we have a group of young, uh, young people. I think young men or young people mm -hmm. could be women also with them from Alabama, the great state of Alabama, and uh, they're in Peru, and we're working on that right now, trying to get them out. It's a large group. It's about 300. Well, we're going to work it out, Jeff. Mr. President, two sort of foreign policy-related questions. In your talk with the G7 leaders earlier this week, did you discuss together ending or postponing the Olympics? Yeah, we did discuss it. Uh, as you know, uh, Prime Minister Abiy was on the call, and that's a big decision for him. And uh, we don't know what his decision is, but we'd live with his decision. It's a tough situation. They've done an incredible job. Japan has done an incredible job on building the venues, getting them built. You know, you've seen so many Olympic uh, venues that have been a disaster over the years where they cost five times more than they were supposed to. They weren't ready in time. Japan has been just the opposite. Uh, they built it beautifully. They built it for what it was supposed to be built for. Uh, but then he got hit with the same thing that the rest of the world got hit with unexpectedly. Uh, he has he has told us that he has not made a decision as to what to do. And also on foreign policy, have you spoken to the leaders of Saudi Arabia or Russia and encouraged them to stop this glut of oil that is affecting the market? Well, the one thing I will tell you is that from the standpoint, you always get a little bit torn because, you know, until we became the leading producer, uh, I was always for the uh, person driving the car and filling up the tank of gas, and uh, you'd have gasoline, and the prices were — if they were too high, I would always raise hell with OPEC. And uh, I was always somebody that likes it. I never thought I'd see 22 and 24 and 28 dollars a barrel. But that's what we have. And uh, in one way, our consumer 
is very much uh, helped. It's like it's like a massive tax increase. That's bigger than any tax increase decrease that you could give. You know, we can give all these big tax cuts, but they're paying so little for gasoline. But uh, on the other hand, it hurts a great industry and a very powerful industry. So uh, I spoke with numerous people that have a lot to do with it, and uh, we have a lot of power over the situation, and uh, we're trying to find some kind of a medium ground. You know, it's it's very devastating to Russia because when you look, I mean, the whole economy is based on that, and they have — we have the lowest oil prices in decades. So it's very devastating to Russia. I would say it's very bad for Saudi Arabia, but they're in a fight. Uh, they're in a fight on price. They're in a fight on output. And uh, at the at the appropriate time, I'll get involved. Yeah. And forgive me if I if I missed it. What will the uh, Carnival cruise ships be used for? Well, Mickey called up and he said, uh, "If you need them, and we haven't said yes, I'll call Governor Cuomo. I'll I'll call uh, Gavin from Gavin Newsom, Governor from California. I'll call a few of the other governors. They're going to bring it up today because we're meeting through phone, through telephone, telephonically, as they say, in a little while at FEMA." I'm going out of FEMA from here. Do you think you can increase hospital beds? Well, you can increase uh, places to stay. Let's say places to stay, if it works. I mean, you know, I don't know. Maybe people won't want them. But he made the offer. It was a very generous offer. And uh, he said that uh, he has uh, some ships that would be ideally suited for what we're doing. And certainly, they have a lot of rooms. They're big, and they have a lot of rooms. So we appreciate it from Carnival. At what point in the future will any American who wants a test be able to get a test? Because you're talking about not needing a test right now if you're not showing any symptoms, but a lot not of the needing the test or, or or only getting tested if um, you're showing symptoms. But a lot of this. Well, no, you should only get. It. You are should. I didn't have any symptoms that I got a test, but I got a test because you people were driving everybody crazy. So that's the only reason I had no symptoms, but I had a test. And uh, my doctor told me, don't get it. You don't need it. Everybody said, you don't need it. But I had to do it because the press was going crazy. And uh, then after I got it, they said, you shouldn't have gotten it. You had no symptoms. You know, the whole thing. So in other words, if you get it, it was no good. But that's — I'm a unique case, unfortunately. Uh, but no, people that don't show symptoms and people that have doctors that say they shouldn't get it, I would rely on that. Yeah, I would rely on that. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Do you consider the term Chinese? OAN. Yes, sir. Thank very you. good. Thank you very questions. much. Um, you treat me very nicely. Do Go you ahead. consider the term Chinese food racist because no. it's food that originates in China or it has Chinese No, I don't think it's and racist. On that note, I don't think it's racist at all. On that note, major left-wing news media, even in this room, have teamed up with Chinese Communist Party narratives, and they are claiming you are racist for making these claims about Chinese virus. Is it alarming that major media players just to oppose you are consistently siding with foreign state propaganda, Islamic radicals, and Latin gangs and cartels, and they work right here at the White House with direct access to you and your team? It amazes me when I read the things that I read. It amazes me when I read the Wall Street Journal, which is always so negative. Uh, it amazes me when I read the New York Times is not even — I don't — I barely read it. You know, we don't distribute it in the White House anymore, and the same thing with the Washington Post. Uh, because, you see, I know the truth. And people out there in the world, they really don't know the truth. They don't know what it is. Uh, they use different slogans and different concepts for me almost every week, trying to catch something. Last week, it was all chaos. You see me. I, there's no chaos. I have no chaos. I'm the one telling everybody to be calm. There's no chaos in the White House. We have unbelievable professionals. It's really — I mean, I think I came up with the term. I hope I came up with the term. But it is fake news. It's more than fake news. It's corrupt news. Uh, they write stories without calling anybody. They write a story uh, — today, uh, I had a couple of stories where they, they never call me, ever, that I know of. At least, nobody tells me. Uh, they'll write a story about me without even asking my opinion on something. It's totally fake. I've never seen — I mean, there is a story in The Wall Street Journal today about, uh, you know, about how we've done — we've done a phenomenal job on this. The governors are even — even Gavin Newsom, who, you know, I'm usually fighting with over the fires, and I think you should do a different kind of a job at the — in the forests and lots of things. We've we argue a lot. 
But Gavin Newsom's been very, very generous. Generous. Andrew Cuomo's been really very generous. I mean, they're saying we're doing a great job, and everybody's saying. But then you'll read this fa phony story in the Wall Street Journal, or well, the Washington Post is going wild lately. I don't know what happened to them. I guess uh, something happened, like we don't call them back or whatever. But the Washington Post, these are very dishonest uh, media sources. They're very dishonest. And you know what? Someday, hopefully in five years, I won't be here, and that'll be fine. I will have done, I think, a great job, because I don't think anyone's done as much in three and a half years as I've done, I don't think, and the administration. This administration has done a great job. But the press is very dishonest. But more than dishonest, they're siding with state propaganda. Well, I think they do. I mean, I mean, they are siding with — they are siding with China. They are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. They're siding with many others. China is the least of it. So why — why they're doing this, uh, you'll have to ask them. But if we had an honest media in this country, our country would be an even greater place. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We are very excited about — we are very excited about, in, in, you know, specifically uh, what we talked about with the chloroquine. Uh, I think the uh, — I think it could be something really incredible. It could totally depress the times that we had mentioned. Wait, excuse me, excuse me. It could totally depress any time that we're talking about, if it works. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that I have to believe. Again, uh, Dr. Hahn is the expert, but a lot of reasons that I would have to think that it could uh, have a very positive effect or a, a positive effect. Maybe not very, but maybe — maybe positive. Uh, I think it's, to me, very, very exciting. And the beauty is — I think I can say this, Steve — the beauty is that these drugs have been out there. So the really danger part of the drugs, especially chloroquine, it's been out there for years. So we know it's something that can be taken safely. So it's very important. Go ahead. by which folks are going to be able to actually use um, these medicines, because I believe there were at least two cited, maybe more. How quickly do you think people will be able to use them? And then if you can update us on the vaccine, I know it's fast track. Well, the President has asked us to expedite this. And what I want to assure you, because of the questions that were asked, we want to make sure that this is done well and right for the American people. The President is right. With an off-the-shelf drug, we do have a lot of information about the side effects of the drug. So that really helps in terms of expediting. But, but I want to assure you that we're working as quickly as we can. I don't want to speculate about a timeline at this point. With respect to vaccines, uh, that's in phase one trial, as I mentioned. We're expecting that to proceed moving forward. And we're work working with a number of different other companies about vaccine development. The President had noted phase one was fast-tracked. Is it possible phase two and phase three can be fast-tracked? that we might see a vaccine before that year? You, get, you said it could potentially be a year. This is a terrific question, and we are really trying hard at FDA to partner with great industry, great academic partners to do exactly that. No promises can be made, but one thing that we're doing is really working hard to, to fast-track as much as possible. And they are. We're going to have other times to meet. We'll be meeting Hopefully not for very long. I mean, I would like to see this get cleared up, and we think we've — to me, this was a very important uh, uh, conference, because I really think there's great potential here. And uh, a lot of people are going to be trying it soon, like literally very soon, literally in a matter of days, if not sooner in some cases. It's already being experimented with, and there's been some very good results. Uh, we'll see what happens. But if if we can be even partially right, maybe we'll be fully right, but even partially right on it, uh, this whole subject becomes a much more pleasant subject. So thank you all. And we'll uh, — we're going over to FEMA now, so I don't know who's going. But we're going to FEMA. We're going to be discussing with the governors and lots of other people. Now, well, I think that's enough. Thank you. Thank you.